as Chris said, I woke up this morning and uh, looked out the window and four inches of snow on the garden. And uh, so Bournemouth feels kind of Mediterranean in comparison. It's quite, quite nice here, our funny little microclimate that we've got. Um, but this evening, what we're here to talk about is freedom, or, or what it means to be free. And I, I wonder what you think of when you think of freedom. Uh, perhaps for you, freedom is the idea of waking up yesterday morning and the un- alarm clock didn't go off because nobody set it, because you had a lion. Uh, Nobody needed to be driven to ballet or to football practice. No one needed to go and do any food shopping. All the DIY around the house has been completed and no one is hogging the TV or the sofa. And the morning is yours to use as you want. Maybe that's freedom. Maybe yours is slightly different. Maybe your idea of freedom is just a, a vision of a couple of months' time when you feel that sense of euphoria because all of your exams are completed. None of your lecturers are asking you for dissertations or essays or anything else and and all your projects are in and and you're completely finished for the year and you've got a five or six month summer or whatever you get and and you're ready for for that. Maybe that is your idea of freedom. Time to do with as you wish. Maybe for you freedom is a bit of a scary thought for your parents. Maybe it's the first time they leave you home alone for a weekend and they go off to visit some some dull relatives you don't want to see and uh, you've got no one around you to tell you what to do or when to go to bed or who you can or can't invite over. It's a scary thought for some parents here. I think maybe you'll cancel your trip to see Aunt Agnes or whatever. But um, freedom can mean different things for different people. But often when you talk about freedom, suppose we were to go out into the street, and we probably wouldn't find anyone because it's too cold, but we root around a bit, and we find someone and ask them, well, does freedom make you think of church, or does freedom make you think of Christianity? I imagine that the two words, they don't really seem to fit together all that well. But if you were here over the, um, last week or you're here next week, you'll know that we're going to be talking about the Apostle Paul. And this guy, Paul, his idea of freedom and his idea of Christianity, they fitted together perfectly. And actually, he said that Christians are the freest people you will ever meet. Now, now this may seem very strange, and so I'd like us to read a, a bit from the Bible, something that Paul wrote. Uh, it's in a book called Galatians. I think actually it was probably, it's my opinion, maybe not everybody shares it, that it's actually the first book of the Bible in the New Testament that was written. So we're going to see really early ideas of, of what Christianity was all about. So if you've got a Bible with you this evening, uh, turn to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. Um, if you haven't, then it'll be on the screens either side of me. The Apostle Paul writes this. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is required to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But by faith, we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whoever he may be. Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offence of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. You, my brothers, were called to be free. Do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Let's pray together. Father, I I pray that this evening, as we study your word and as we look at it closely now, uh, that your Holy Spirit will speak to us, and we will understand, uh, perhaps for the first time, or maybe for the hundredth time, the amazing truth of your gospel. Please apply it to our hearts, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, a little section from the New Testament like that may seem very peculiar. It's all about circumcision and odd things that we uh, tend not to talk about in polite company. But we'll get back to that in a minute. Just want to remind you what we did last week. Um, If you were here, uh, you'll remember, hopefully. If you weren't, then what we were talking about is this man called Paul, or Saul as he was known as back then. 
And Saul was a pretty horrible man, really. He was a religious fundamentalist. He was uh, bent on the destruction of the church. And his, his role, really, was to go around and find Christians and throw them in prison. Uh, if a few got killed in kind of mob uprisings and stonings along the way, uh, he wouldn't be too upset. And so his role was this, really. He wasn't interested in following Jesus. He wasn't interested in what uh, Christianity had to offer. But on his way to a, a city called Damascus, uh, along the way, he was uh, confronted by Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus, and completely changed and given a second chance and turned around. Uh, and we said this was completely by God's grace, not something which he had deserved to have, not even something he was looking for. And from that moment on, we see a different man. Uh, kind of as time goes on, his name is changed as well from Saul to Paul. But this man is completely transformed. And so this week, we're going to think about what happens over the next few decades in his life. And next week, we're going to see what happens as he approaches death. So over these three weeks, hopefully, we'll see what transforms the life of Saul and turns him into this man, Paul. But this week, I want to talk about him traveling around and setting up churches, because that's basically all he did for decades and decades after he met Jesus on this road to a city in Syria. And you would notice, if you had a little look back in Galatians 1, interestingly, it says that um, as soon as he had met Jesus on this road, pretty much the first thing he did was he went to Arabia. Now, that seems a bit odd, doesn't it? Why would you go to Arabia? And, and some people think it's for kind of a religious retreat or something. He went to meditate and get kind of in contact with God. But the immediate context in there, actually what it says, um, is he's just been told that his job is not to share the gospel with people who already knew about um, the Old Testament and Moses and Abraham, people called Jewish people, the Jews, but he was meant to go to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. And so he goes to the first nearest non-Jewish place he can find, Arabia, and starts to tell people about Jesus, who've never heard of anything from the Bible before. And basically he keeps on doing that for the next 30 or so years. Um, don't worry too much about the detail in these maps, but um, a few of the things he did, you can see right over in the uh, far right-hand corner there, um, there's a city called Antioch. You might not be able to see it. It's quite small writing. But you can see that little loop he does there. Uh, he takes it not just from this place in Syria, but across um, into Cyprus, then up into Turkey. You can see there's another place called Antioch. Very confusing. And then down into a place called um, Lystra and Derby, those two, two little cities. Then he does a U-turn and heads back again. Uh, his first little missionary journey, stopping off every, everywhere he went, telling people about the second chance that he'd been given by Jesus. Uh, then he goes on another journey. He's just addicted to telling people about Jesus. And this time, you can say he goes way, way further. This time, uh, he doesn't stop in Antioch and go uh, just stop there. But he goes further. You can see there's a city called Troas, kind of on the, the edge of the Aegean Sea there. Um, and then he goes across uh, into what we call Greece these days. And, and lots of the cities there are familiar to us because there's books of the Bible uh, named after them. You can see there's Philippi, there's Thessalonica, uh, Corinth down in the south, Athens he visits. Um, and there's an amazing chapter in, in, in chapter 17 of Acts, which would be worth a read uh, if you want to read on a bit about Paul. Um, Ephesus on his home trip, we know about the book to the Ephesians, don't we? And, and all these places, little communities of People who followed Jesus began to grow up there and began to start to, um, to reach out to the people in their community. And all the way, they were talking about this second chance which they'd been given by Jesus and about the freedom which they'd found. And that's what I want us to talk about tonight. There are other journeys he did. We won't go into the details of them tonight. Uh, there's a fourth journey which Paul made, one big journey, and we'll learn about that next week, uh, but not one that he chose to make, one that uh, decisions were made for him. Anyway, this idea of freedom... You can see that Paul's idea of Christianity is very different to the average man on the street. I think if you were to ask most people, uh, you'd probably find that Christianity seems a bit outdated. Perhaps it's about kind of a bit of a moral way of living. There are rules of things you should do, things you shouldn't do. But it certainly doesn't muster up words like freedom, does it? It's more about how you should live and, and what you should do. Perhaps there's a God who people imagine up in the sky and he's a bit fearsome, mighty certainly, he has a big list of rules, kind of the Ten Commandments and stuff, all in big kind of plaques of stone. And, and he checks to see if you're doing what he expects you to do. And one day you'll stand before him. And if you've done enough, then you'll be all right. But if you kind of tip below 50% good works or whatever, then you're in big trouble. That, that's the average kind of impression you might have of God if you spoke to the sort of person who, who's the average British person on the street. But actually what Paul says is completely different. It's not laborious. It's not a heavy load to bear. It's freedom. Look at what he says in verse 1. We read it just a moment ago. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Don't let yourself be burdened with a heavy yoke. This is a, a free Christianity. 
And he actually says that completely the opposite. Um, sorry, he actually says that, that this idea of it being a heavy load is the complete opposite of what Christianity is really about. Now, in this little section, as I said, it's, it kind of talks about odd things which we don't really talk about these days, like circumcision and stuff. But if we look below the surface, we can see that actually it reflects the kind of views that people often have in our society. And Paul deconstructs, uh, deconstructs them and rips them apart and then builds them back together again to show us what Christianity is really like. Look at verses 2 and 3 and 4, for example. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare that every man who lets himself be circumcised, um, that he was required to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. What he's getting at is that this idea that, that Christianity is about do's and don'ts, that we make ourselves acceptable to God by achieving certain things or by following certain rules, that couldn't be further from the truth. Now, now the law which was relevant here is to do with circumcision. You find it all through the Old Testament. It's the mark of being uh, part of the people of Israel. And this was a big issue in the first century because, uh, as you can tell, I mean, we saw on our maps, didn't we? It started out with the church being in Jerusalem and, and pretty much everyone who was a Christian um, was a Jew as well. But gradually, as, as Paul and others went out to different parts of the world, people from all different nations and countries started to become Christians. And so gradually, because there's less Jewish people in the world than Gentiles or non-Jews, as more people become Christians, the balance is inevitably going to tip, isn't it? And more people in the church will be non-Jews to Jews. And so this created a whole really difficult kind of um, scenario in the, in the church where people were working out, well, what do we do with these non-Jewish people? Do they need to get circumcised as well? Do they need to kind of fall in line with the laws of the Old Testament just like we have been up until now? And Paul says no. Paul says that, that Christianity isn't about following a bunch of rules. Now, for you, maybe, as you come into church this evening, you might have different preconceptions. You're probably not thinking, oh, well, I wonder if I need to get circumcised this evening. It's probably not on your list of things to think about. But, but maybe you're thinking, well, how often do I need to come to church to be a Christian? How much of the Bible do I need to read each day to be a Christian? What can I do? What can't I do in my relationships? Is it acceptable for me to sleep with my girlfriend? Is it okay for me to tell a little white lie? How much do I put in the offering bag? And, and all these questions are going through your mind. And Paul says, none of that is relevant. None of that has anything to do with how God views you or how you are relating to God. It's completely irrelevant. He says here about circumcision, doesn't he? Or to, sorry, about, um, about the law. If you're trying to be justified by the law, you've alienated yourself from Christ, he says in verse 4. It's though, it's as though he's saying, if that is your view of Christianity, you are a million miles away from the real Jesus. If you think that it's about what you can do, about the steps that you can take to, to please God, the, the kind of good works you can gather together and sort of pile up and bring to God and say, look what I've done. If that's how you see Christianity, you don't have a clue about Jesus. If you think that it's about church attendance and putting money in the offering or confession or about reading your Bible regularly or about doing good works or about helping out in charity or any of those things, if that is how you expect to make your way closer and closer to God, you don't even know Jesus. Paul is blunt here. He gets blunter as we go on, so brace yourselves if you think that's strong. Um, but he tells us what the opposite is, and the opposite is the reality. The opposite is real Christianity. Um, have a look with me at verse 5. But by faith, we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And there's loads we could pick out from there. You probably find, if, you, if you've read Paul's letters, sometimes his thoughts are so dense, there's so much in there, you could kind of talk for about three and a half hours on one sentence. It's so intense. But, but just to pick out a few things there. In verse 5, he says, Christianity, it's pr primarily, the thing which we do is have faith. And that's really it. Now, faith's a bit of a mystical word, I think, isn't it? It's the sort of word we use in church, but uh, we rarely use in everyday life. Um, but I think one of the ways we can demystify it is, is to see that actually it's very similar to a few other words we use regularly. Um, the word faith here uh, can be translated trust. 
And I think that's quite a helpful way to think about it. Actually, it's the same Greek word. Sometimes you see the word trust in the New Testament, and it's the same word which goes to faith or to trust. And trust is much more normal, isn't it? We can talk about trusting one another or trusting someone or trusting somebody else. It's not abnormal. Faith seems a lit, uh, kind of a bit Christian, a bit churchy, and a bit... You don't know what you're saying when you say you're having faith in someone. But to trust someone, that makes sense. We can understand that. And, and about as... I mean, not grammatically speaking, but just in terms of what the action is, to trust someone... Is really passive, isn't it? You don't trust someone because you can do it. A baby can trust its mother to protect it and to provide for it. And the baby couldn't protect itself or provide for itself, but it trusts its mother to do it because it can't. Or let's say you're going for a big operation. You're going to hospital and you're going to have uh, an organ transplant. Now, you've got to trust that the surgeon's going to do a good job. And once you go under the anaesthetic, you, you can't try and have a really good organ transplant and try and have your new kidney transplanted into you well, can you? Whatever you do, it's irrelevant. You have to trust the surgeon to do it for you. It's, it's impossible for you to do anything to make it any more successful than it will be unless they do a good job. And the same thing is true here. Paul is saying we must trust God. That is it. If you're trusting in anything you can do or, or trying to top up what Jesus has done with a few good works or a bit of church attendance or, or some extra, uh, an extra bit of money in the offering bag, that's hopeless. That's mad. You don't understand the first thing about the message of the Bible from start to finish. It's about trusting God, trusting him to do it all. And what does he do? We'll look a bit further down in those verses. It's about what the Spirit can do for us. Now, we talked a bit about the Holy Spirit last week, about how the Holy Spirit changes a human being, how Paul was, uh, instantly saw a transformation in himself as the Holy Spirit, um, the posh word we might use is to sanctify us, to, to make us more like Jesus. But here, what, what Paul is talking about is another aspect of what happens, how we're made righteous. We're changed once and for all, at one point in the future. We don't know when it will be, but, but when Jesus comes again, and this is what, what kind of posh theologians call glorification, that one day we'll be completely transformed to be like Jesus. That our kind of sanctification, that changing that you go through bit by bit, day by day, as the Holy Spirit makes you different to how you used to be. That will take you so far, but we'll never be perfect this side of glory. But one day when Jesus comes back, we have the hope that he will transform us through the Spirit to be like him to be completely righteous. And add to that, what, what Paul doesn't talk about here, but what he talks about elsewhere, that when God looks at you or me right now, if we've trusted Jesus, then, then what he did on the cross applies to us now. So all the wrong things that you've ever done, everything that's ever offended God, that whole attitude of your prior life where you didn't want anything to do with God, all of that evil is heaped on Jesus and punished on him on the cross. And all of his goodness and all of his righteousness, everything about him which pleases God and makes him smile is put on you. This incredible switch. And all of this is done for us, not because of anything we do, not because... God looks at you and thinks, well, you're a good person. You've been to church several times this year and you've read the Bible from cover to cover. Well, very impressive. No, it's nothing that, that we do which impresses God. It's everything that he has done for us. And unless your understanding of Christianity falls in line with this, what Paul has discovered, it's not real Christianity at all. But it's a wonderful message, isn't it? A wonderful message. And he hammers it home in verse 6, doesn't he? He talks about circumcision and uncircumcision. We could talk about anything that is, a, is an attitude we have where we're following a law or not. We could say um, going to church or not going to church is irrelevant to this argument. Reading your Bible regularly or not is irrelevant to this argument. Whether you have a good moral upstanding kind of approach to life or not is irrelevant to this argument. What counts is whether you're trusting Jesus or not. And you can see that this naturally leads to freedom. The alternative naturally leads to slavery, doesn't it? You think about it. If, if your whole life is consumed with what you must do, a list of laws, things you must do, you feel obliged by God because he's up in the sky ready to give you a whack around the head if you don't do it. You're obliged to go to church. You're obliged to read your Bible. You're obliged to be nice to other Christians. You're obliged not to speed in your car. You're obliged to give a bit of money to charity, maybe 10%, because that's what you've heard other people do. All of those kind of things, it feels such drudgery, isn't it? It's a heavy load you're, you're wearing around your neck and it's weighing you down. That's not freedom. But what about the alternative? That's what people think Christianity is like. But, but this is what Paul says Christianity is really like. This is what he's experienced when he met Jesus and Jesus turned his life upside down. 
He experienced this transformation and this free gift from Jesus. Now, if that's the case, if, if everything that makes us acceptable to God is a gift from Jesus, if it's all done for us, if it's all already complete, if there's nothing we can do to make it better or nothing we can do to make it worse, if we can't make God love us more than he already does or make him love us less than he already does, then suddenly our load is lifted, isn't it? Suddenly we're not carrying around the weight of having to go to church. But you know what? If you want to go to church to meet with other Christians and to encourage them, you can. And you're not doing it because you're trying to twist God's arm or trying to make him like you a bit more. You're doing it because you can and because you want to and because you want to worship him together with other Christians. Suddenly, everything feels so much more free than it was before. Now, the sad thing is that this is often not the case. And Paul puts it down to, well, I think naturally we tend, to, we tend to go towards this, don't we? Naturally, we tend to look at things legalistically. We'd love to have little rules that we can follow to, to please God. But Paul notices here that these people, not only do they naturally fall into this temptation, but, but someone's been pushing them in that direction as well. Look at verse 7. You were running a good race, but who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? What kind of persuasion, sorry, that kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you? And he talks about these agitators, doesn't he? Look at verse 12. As for those agitators, I wish that they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. That's supposed to be funny, by the way. If there's bits in the Bible which are supposed to be quite funny, and this bit is funny if you get it. So the, the idea is that these people are saying, well, let's please God by circumcising ourselves. So let's chop off a foreskin. And he's saying, well, if God's so pleased when you chop off your foreskin, why not chop the whole lot off? How overjoyed will he be then? So it's supposed to be a bit of a joke, a bit of hyperbole or something, a bit of exaggeration to kind of make people laugh. But Paul's exaggerating to just show how ridiculous it is. How could having a small minor operation to affect your genitalia make you more pleasing to God? It's ridiculous. And so Paul is saying this is madness. What are you doing here? And he obviously shows that these agitators are not in his good books. Now, just a thought. We are all Christians here. Well, most of us are Christians here. There are a few people, perhaps this is new for them. But for most of us here, this is familiar ground. We've heard this before. In our head, we know this kind of, that it makes sense. We know about the freedom of a Christian. We know that it's all from God and not from us. But how often do we ever kind of slip back into thinking like this or maybe not even thinking like this maybe we wouldn't even admit it to ourselves but we act like this when we come to church are you here this evening for a second service of the day maybe you've been uh, in church for almost kind of three hours by the time this finishes are you here because you want to be here because you're free to be here or are you here because you feel obliged to be here because christians are supposed to come to church because good christians come to church twice a day Maybe if you didn't turn up, you'd wonder how people would view you. Would they see you as a a slightly lesser Christian? Are are you here because you want to be here? Because you're free to be here? Because you want to praise Jesus and you want to meet with a congregation of other people who love Jesus, your family, your brothers and sisters in Jesus? Or are you here because you feel as though you should? When the offering bag goes round and it snakes up and down the pubes and you put in £10, perhaps, do you put in £10 because you want to? because you're excited about how the money might be spent to advance the kingdom of God? Or do you put in £10 because, well, you should do. Christians give 10% each week or whatever. Or or perhaps you put it in because somebody else put in £10 down the road and you want to make sure you look just as good as they do. When you get up in the morning and you open your Bible, even if no one else is watching, and you read a chapter because that seems reasonable, do you read it because you want to hear from God? Because incredibly, through the Holy Spirit, the God who created the universe, the one we talked about earlier when Chris was just sharing with us some of those verses, because that God can speak directly to you through the pages of the scriptures. Is that why you open it? Or do you open it out of a sense of drudgery, that it's what we must do? It's our duty. It's our obligation. Of course, there is a sense of duty in Christianity. I don't want to rule that out. But I think all too often, even if up here in our heads we know that we are freely pardoned by God, that there's nothing we can do to add to our salvation, sometimes our practice kind of betrays our theology. And actually what we do and the way that we act is out of duty, not out of joy and out of freedom. That's a challenge for us, isn't it? It's a challenge for us as leaders of the church as well. I think with everything we do, the last thing we want to do is heap on people a heavy yoke, something they have to carry, which is hard enough to carry already. We're thinking about this with the streams that have come in recently. 
And we're, we're overjoyed with how many people have come along to streams and got involved. And I think uh, it probably exceeds our expectations by quite a long way. And it seems to be a really successful um, venture for the church. But the last thing we wanted was for people to feel, well, this is something I must go to. This is another thing I have to go to. Two services was long enough, three hours. Now we're talking four hours at church during the day, and I have to go if I'm going to be a Christian. We don't want to encourage that mentality because that brings us close to being like these agitators who are encouraged in legalism, who are weighing people down with what they must do. And the Christian gospel says, well, actually, you don't need to do anything. Actually, there is nothing you need to do. You don't need to read your Bible. You don't need to come to church. You don't need to pray. You don't need to go to confession. You don't need to live a moral life. In fact, none of these things do you need to do. Because everything that is needed is done by Jesus. Now, Paul is so radical and so kind of out there with that that it seems uncomfortable. Kind of, can I say things like that from the pulpit? I feel uncomfortable about saying them. But it's what Paul is saying here. Now, someone else who was just as radical and just as out there and just as kind of uh, aggressive with the gospel um, in his own time was a man called Martin Luther. You might have come across him. I think he was so radical that I'm not sure I'd feel comfortable about letting him preach in Lansdowne. Will we let him preach here, Paul? Uh, Chris? Maybe. Possibly. Uh, Martin Luther lived about 500 years ago, and he was, um, he was German, and he was a monk, and he was um, tenacious. And uh, he wrote letters to people to help them to kind of uh, encourage them in their Christian life. And there was one guy who was struggling pretty much with, with this problem. His name was Jerome Weller. And uh, he was struggling with the fact that he felt that there were laws which he had to keep. He, he couldn't get it out of his mind that actually, because of what Jesus had done, he had to do nothing to add to his salvation. And, and Martin Luther writes this. This is the end of his letter. I wouldn't necessarily advise everything he advises uh, in a pastoral situation. See what you think. Accordingly, if the devil should say, do not drink, you should reply to him on this very account, because you forbid me, I shall drink. And what is more, I shall drink a generous amount. Thus, one must always do the opposite of that which Satan prohibits. What do you think is my reason for drinking wine undiluted, talking freely and eating more often, if it is not to torment and vex the devil, who made uh, up his mind to torment and vex me? Would that I could commit some token sin simply for the sake of mocking the devil, so that he might understand that I acknowledge no sin and am conscious of no sin. When the devil attacks and torments us, we must completely set aside the whole Ten Commandments. Then the devil, sorry, when the devil throws our sins up at us and declares that we deserve death and hell, we ought to speak thus, I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? Does this mean that I shall be sentenced to eternal, eternal damnation? By no means, for I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, where he is, there I shall also be yours, Martin Luther. Quite a fiery character. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you commit token sins just to irritate the devil. But you get the point uh, that if the devil says, don't do this. You know, if you do this, it'll upset God so much that he won't let you into heaven. Then Luther says, that's a load of rubbish. And so he drinks a, a generous amount or whatever just to prove that drinking won't get you out of heaven. That actually everything you've done, uh, sorry, everything that needs to be done has been done by Jesus. There is such freedom, such utter liberty in Christianity that we couldn't do everything. Even if we set about trying to destroy our own salvation, we couldn't. Because Jesus has done everything that is possible. An indestructible salvation he has provided for us. It's amazing. But if we've gone about this the right way, then at this point, perhaps you're feeling a bit kind of uneasy. This feels a bit weird, doesn't it? That Christians have no restrictions, no limits, complete liberty, complete freedom. Everything is theirs to do or not do or whatever they want to do. They can drink if they want to. They can not go to church if they don't want to. They can, they can read their Bible if they want to or not if they don't want to because everything's been done by Jesus. Maybe that makes you feel a bit weird inside. And probably, if you're a Christian, it's because you're being sanctified, and that feels very unnatural to you, because that's the power of the Holy Spirit working in you, which is great, isn't it? But uh, what we're talking about here is something slightly different, because Paul tells us that's not the way to be. You know, as a Christian, you could do what you liked. You could live as you wanted, because everything has been done for you by Jesus. But is that how you should be? Ha have a look, just as, as Paul kind of comes into land and, and brings this to a close. Look at how he squares things up again. Verse 13. You, my brothers, uh, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. 
The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. As I said, as, as Paul kind of brings it into the land, he brings a bit of balance to this. Yes, on the one hand, Christians have complete, utter freedom. Because there's nothing we did to achieve our salvation, there's nothing we could do to destroy our salvation, right? But, on the other hand, we're now left as completely free people, with complete liberty. What do we do with it? And Paul says it's very simple. You use it in the way that God would want you to. So that means that although we don't need to come to church... Well, shall we come to church? Yeah, why not? Let's encourage other Christians. Let's learn about God together. Let's pray and worship God together. Brilliant. What a great thing to do. Should we read our Bible? Of course we should read our Bible. It's a a wonderful way to let God speak to you on a day-to-day basis. Should we help each other? Yes, he talks about loving each other here. But we can do it freely. Now, this is really interesting because if I relied on what I was doing to make me a Christian, or to make me forgiven by God, then as I, I don't know, say you're ill, and I bring a nice casserole around to your house and give you, give you a meal, as I do that, do I have an ulterior motive? Well, if I'm trying to please God, of course I have. I'm, I'm giving you a casserole. I probably like you. I'm probably being quite nice. But deep down, the reason I'm doing it is because I'm afraid that God will smite me if I don't. But if I know that there's no chance in all eternity that God will ever turn me away, and I bring you around a casserole, And I bring it around just out of love. Not because I'm afraid of what God might do to me or worried about what he might take from me, because I know that that is completely secure. I can kind of be loving to you without an ulterior motive. Not in the way that that so many people are. I can be loving just for the sake of being loving. Just because I've been loved so much by God that I want to give some of that back to you. If I read my Bible, I can read it because I actually want to, because it's an amazing book and because I can see how God speaks to me when I read it. Not because I have to, not because I'm obliged to, but because I want to. There's incredible freedom, incredible liberty here because everything is done by Jesus. I think of it now. Something amazing happened at Christmas. I bought a history book with a book voucher from uh, Waterstones. And this is quite a shock for me, really, because when I was doing my ASs, I did history. And I was put off history for quite a while. I only did it for one year because we had a teacher, and I can't even remember what her name is, so she'll remain anonymous. Um, But the reason she put me off is because we spent an entire year, well, we had her once a week, and then we had a good teacher the other three lessons of the week or whatever. But we did a whole year, or a whole, I think it was, doing public health in the 18th century. Yeah, it sounds good, doesn't it? You're wishing you were doing that if you're doing your your A-levels now. Public health in the 18th century. You may remember, if you've done this, Edwin Chadwick, who was a pretty exciting guy, and his claim to fame was introducing earthenware pipes to London. Mm, Yeah, and and this really put me off history because we spent, I don't know, we had this big, thick book and there were no pictures or anything and it was just about pipes. And and the other thing it talked about a lot was cholera epidemics, epidemics, which is always exciting to talk about. So I had an entire year of Edwin Chadwick and earthenware pipes and cholera epidemics and it really put me off history pretty much for, for, I don't know, 10 years or something. And and so this Christmas, buying a a history book was, was quite amazing. But the difference is... I didn't have to learn about earthenware pipes and Edwin Chadwick and cholera epidemics for an exam. I was obliged to. If I didn't, whatever the teacher was called would have probably told me off and I would have got in trouble and I would have failed my exam. Well, I did do quite badly anyway. But, um, but I would have done worse if I hadn't have read any of this book. And so I had to do it because I was obliged to, because I had to, because that was the rules and that's what you do. But, but I've bought this book and I'm really enjoying it and I'm just reading it for fun. And I sometimes even turn off the TV and read a book and it's amazing and uh, I'm enjoying it. And, and it's because I don't have to, it's because I can, because I can choose to. And it's the same thing here with, with what we're talking about in this passage, that we can love each other as a Christian community in a way that we never could if we were earning God's favour. If we just had to, because that's the rules and you've got to, and if you don't, God's going to smash you down, then you don't ever love anyone really. You don't ever serve anybody really. You don't ever come to church for the right reasons. But if what you do has no bearing on how God loves you, if he's always going to love you, regardless of whether you do it or not, then you can do it for the right reasons. See, the funny thing is, as Christians, we are completely free 
completely, utterly free, liberated. There's nothing which we could add to our salvation because Jesus has done it at all. We're completely free, but we're completely free to make ourselves slaves. That's the wonderful paradox of it, isn't it? You are completely free to be a genuine slave for someone just because you want to be and to serve each other. And so as we kind of bring this into land, if you are not a Christian this evening, then I'm hoping that what we've said has come as a surprise to you. Maybe it's a bit of a shock because you saw Christianity as just a a bunch of rules or maybe just a kind of moral framework or or a way to live your life. And hopefully, if all things go according to plan, you'll get your way to heaven heaven in the end. But you found that, that actually Christianity is about freedom. It's about what Jesus gives to you, not about what you can offer to him. And if we are Christians here this evening, then that will be familiar to us. But let's just make sure it's really in our heads and in our hearts, in the way that we act. When you wake up tomorrow morning and you get up and your Bible is there and you think to yourself, should I open it? Should I read it? Do open it. Do read it. But not for the wrong reason. Not because you feel obliged to. Not because it's what you've got to do because otherwise someone will find out and then they'll think you're a worse Christian or God will find out and he'll be disappointed in you. But open it because you can. Come to church next week because you can. Take someone a pot of casserole if they're ill because you can. Because we're completely free. We're completely free to make ourselves servants to one another. It's a wonderful gospel. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this gospel which is often misrepresented but is incredible good news. Thank you for Paul all those years ago who discovered it and shared it just with everyone that he met. He couldn't stop sharing it. Thank you that he wrote it down for us in books like Galatians so we can read about it and understand it ourselves. Thank you that uh, through those words and through the power of your Holy Spirit, you're speaking to us tonight. And I pray that these words will stick with us all through this week, that we remember that we are free, but know that we can use our freedom to do great good, to serve one another, to love you, not because we're obliged to, but because we can. Amen.